Do you need help protecting your finances as you enter retirement? David Dickens of KC Financial Advisors has got you covered. Welcome to the Cover Your Assets KC podcast. Welcome to another edition of the Cover Your Assets KC Podcast. This is Walter Storholt alongside David Dickens, President, Wealth Advisor at KC Financial Advisors Office in Overland Park. And you can find us worldwide on CoverYourAssetsKC.com. David, great to uh, chat with you this week. How are you, my friend? Well, I'm doing pretty well. Got a, you know, nice little easy week going on and a little podcast with some mailbag questions. I mean, honestly, how could you set up a week any better than that? (laughs) We've had to do a lot of our uh, podcast recordings lately, like on different days and sort of on the fly and different locations and things like that. It's it's weird to have just a normal week for once after (laughs) uh, the last couple of uh, recording sessions, David. We've just sort of haven't been in to just like squeeze it into the busyness. So it sounds like a normal week finally has uh, arrived. Yeah, so far, you know, that's the kiss of death right there. Yeah, it is a Monday. I'm speaking too soon, aren't I? Oh, goodness. Yeah. Who knows what's going to blow up tomorrow, but something will. At least for today, some normalcy. So it gets us the opportunity to do a podcast and answer some of your questions on the show today. It's a mailbag edition of the Cover Your Assets KC podcast. And if you'd like to submit a question to maybe be featured on a future show, you can do that by emailing David. D. Dickens at kcfa.com, or again, get in touch through the website, coveryourassetskc.com. Got three good ones to pepper David with this week. You ready to go, David? I think I'm ready. All right. First one comes to us from Joel. Joel says, I know that I need an emergency fund, but instead of keeping money in a savings account, can't I just use my home equity line if I need money in a pinch? Okay. Well, that's a, actually a really good question, Joel. And you probably find, (laughs) you'll find an advisor who's been in the business a long time like me, who'll give you the exact opposite answer, I'm sure. But I'm going to go with, it's probably okay, especially if you're saving and investing on the side already. So if if you'd be using your your HELOC, your home equity line of credit, because you're already doing, um, you know, maybe your your credit card balances are high. (laughs) or you've got other consumer debt, that would be the absolute wrong thing to do. So, you know, as long as this is, it's money you've got available, you don't, it has a zero balance right now. I don't think it's a horrible thing to do that would free you up then instead of having six, usually an emergency fund is six months of living expenses. And so what you'd be doing is freeing that money up to actually be more of an investment account. and. Um, so I, I would actually be okay with that. Your HELOC is probably open-ended. So in other words, you can, you can write a check on it for whatever it is that might be the emergency and then pay that down and write a check on it and pay it down again. It's probably open-ended for maybe a period of 10 years. And once, once you have a, an amount drawn on it, uh, you probably owe only interest for that 10-year period. And it's probably a relatively modest uh, interest rate. In other words, not like a credit card. So with those types of caveats, Joel, I'd say you're, you're probably okay to do that unless you're using it as a way to further overspend, live further ahead of your means. So, so don't use uh, the HELOC to go on vacation? Is that what you're telling me? Exactly. That is not an emergency. Uh, I have a question. Is it important for this to already be set up, though, if you want to use it in this way? Like if you are saying, well, if I have an emergency, I'll go open up a line of credit. Like you should probably have this in place already. Otherwise, it's probably not fitting into the term of emergency if you have to then actually go through the process of setting it up. Right. So, Walter, that is that is really well said. You you absolutely need to have this set up. I, I can think back when I, I mean, so I'm early 60s. I've, I had this, I used this as a strategy for myself because I didn't want that money sitting around at, you know, basically zero interest. But I always had, every time I'd get, I'd refinance my mortgage, for instance, I would get a new HELOC. It always had a zero balance, but it was just there in case something came up that bit me that I didn't want to have to liquidate investments to go do. So yes, you would absolutely positively want to have it in place before the emergency strikes. All right. Great question, Joel. Thanks for sending that one in. Clever question and uh, one that has some merit to it, it sounds like. Thanks for sending that one in. Again, if you have questions for David, you want to talk out your specific situation, we always invite you to get in touch 
913-317-1414. If you want to have a one-on-one conversation with David and the team at KC Financial Advisors, 913-317-1414 or coveryourassetskc.com. All right, Miriam has our next question. Uh, Miriam says, my husband was born in the 50s, but for some reason, his attitude toward money is like that of some sort of Great Depression era survivor. (laughs) I really think we've saved enough for retirement, but he's convinced that we both need to keep working forever while also never indulging ourselves with any spending over and above the basics. Is there a way to fix this? So this is super common. I would say that the couples I meet with, it's probably at least 50% where they have a differing view of whether they've saved enough. So Miriam, you are, you are, (laughs) this is super common and there is a way to fix it. So I would say that the way to fix this is to have a good plan. Now, if you've listened to me and and Walter over the last year or two, you know that I've said you got to have a good plan probably every other week, but it's so true. Having a plan so you were born, he was born in the 50s. I was born in the 50s. So let's say you're um, somewhere between age 60 and 70. You're probably pretty close to retirement. You may already be retired. But having a good plan is going to give you and your husband the confidence that you're not going to run out of money. Well, you say, maybe you say, well, Dave, we're not worried about running out of money, but we have this amount of inheritance we want to leave to our kids or whatever it is, whoever it is you're leaving it to. Well, that's part of the plan too. Your plan just doesn't work out to be not running out of money. Maybe you want to leave a quarter of a million dollars or half a million dollars or $2 million to somebody. So that's your end game. And you want to make sure you don't violate that. So make sure that you have a really good plan. If that doesn't mean anything to you, I'm pretty sure I didn't go back and look at this, Walter, but I think we did a three-part series early this year, which basically was what does a good plan mean? What's in a good plan? And so, Miriam, you might go back and listen to those podcasts. I'm not going to uh, redo them here. But the one thing you do want to make sure is that when you have a good plan in place, you need to do an annual or so update of that plan because things change. And so you just want to make sure that that is kept up to date. A good plan is needs to include, most plans include the expected. You want to make sure that you also include some unexpected events as well. Like for instance, let's say one of you dies early. Well, that's going to mean changes to your social security income. It may mean changes to your pension income. It's absolutely going to make a a difference in your tax bracket because singles are taxed at a higher rate than joint for the same amount of income. Uh, so you want to make sure that you, you, your plan includes a um, a what if for the death of a spouse. You want to make sure, I think, that you've included a couple of two or three or four years of assisted living. You may not need it, but statistically, you're, 60% of us are going to need some sort of assisted living before we die. And then lastly, you just want to make sure that your plan accounts for some sort of, assuming you have stock market investments, and I'll bet you do, you want to make sure that your that, that your plan can withstand a 5 year bear market in stocks so wh- why is that well because we had a 5 year bear market in 2001 with the dot com bubble bursting and we had a 5 year bear market in 2008 with the financial crisis and all that means is it took 5 years for the market to get back to where it started before that trouble hit And all the time, you're taking money out of those accounts, probably. So that can have a significant impact on your plan. And you want to make sure that the plan you have can withstand that type of financial turmoil. We haven't had one of those now in 13 years. So statistically, we're not going to go another 13 years without a major downturn. We probably won't go another five years without a major downturn. So make sure that's part of your plan too, Miriam. If you get a good plan in place, I think you and your husband will come to some meeting of the minds where you might occasionally overindulge yourself and feel good about it because it fits into your plan. The three-part series you were mentioning, David, was that the, uh, the three things you must understand if you're retiring in three to five years series that we did earlier in the summer? You know, actually, I think maybe January of okay. this year or end of last year, 
it just seems to me as though we did a a three part series on what constitutes what has to be in a good plan. We will look for the uh, for that series and provide links to it in the show notes. I can't off the top of my head or through a quick scroll or check see which episodes those were, but I'll go find it. You know, it. if we, we haven't done it. that, Walter, then maybe we add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> Very good possibility that might be coming to a uh, series near you. We can always get the updated 2021-2022 edition of that of that there you series, go. right? So not a bad thing at all. Uh, if we can find that, we'll link to it in the show notes for you. Great question, Miriam. Thank you for sending that one in to us. Uh, it's a good one and uh, fun to discuss. All right, Grace has our last question here. Uh, again, if you want to submit a question for a future mailbag episode, you can do that at ddickens at kcfa.com. Send an email there. D. Dickens at kcfa.com. Grace says, uh, unfortunately, my dad just died six months ago, and I'm a little worried about my mom, who's in her late 70s and is now in charge of handling the investments for the first time in her life. I don't know much about it myself. What should I tell her to do? Okay, so I've seen this uh, the two times in the last year. Both times, actually, were the wife died and the husband was left behind. But either way, it really is not a gender-oriented thing. So Grace, your question is a good one. I think the first thing you'd want to do is make sure that you check, well, let's see. I was going to say, the first thing you should do is check beneficiary designations on her accounts. But maybe the first thing you need to do, if this is not in your wheelhouse, you don't have an aptitude for this, you really need to find somebody who you can trust, hopefully a fiduciary, and get some really good guidance. You know, the the questions that you're going to want the answers to, amongst others, are are her assets sufficient to take her to the end of her life? And if not, are the things you can do with her spending to shore up that part of her plan? You do need to absolutely, somebody needs to check her beneficiaries to make sure that those are, first of all, that they're named. She might have inherited some accounts from your dad, uh, maybe IRA accounts that listed her as the beneficiary, but no secondary beneficiary. So you need to make sure that now those are her accounts. She has named beneficiaries for those accounts. Uh, Has she named powers of attorney, financial and healthcare powers of attorney? Because now she's on her own. And if she gets to a point where she can't speak for herself, she needs a trusted individual, maybe you, uh, who can do that for her. And then you want to make sure that the assets that she has won't go through probate when she dies. Those assets are probably, most likely, the home she lives in, her bank accounts, and her cars, if she has more than one, even one vehicle, but certainly more than one vehicle, maybe a mobile home. We've done a couple of good podcasts on what to make sure to do with those types of assets to avoid probate. The probate is going to fall on your shoulders, Grace, when, whenever mom dies. So, <laughs> you know, you have, a, you have a dog in this fight too. Mom will, will be, feel much more comfortable with her financial situation if she knows these things are taken care of. And you'll feel more comfortable as either the, the you know, you may have siblings, I don't know, but somebody is going to have to drag all of those types of assets through probate unless you take a few pretty easy steps right now to assure that doesn't happen. And, and Grace, one more thing. This is, I mean, this, uh, this is something that is rarely thought of, but I think I mentioned it in the question that I answered just before for Miriam, but your mother's tax bracket is going to go up next year. Because singles are taxed differently from married filing joint. Here's a, here's a quick example. If your income is under 80,000, 81,000 married filing joint, you're in the 12% bracket. But anything over 40,000 is in the 22% bracket if you're single. So it's real possible that your mother's tax bracket just went up from 12% to 22%. Here's why I mention that. If you listen to us very often, you know that I'm a big fan of Roth IRAs, and she could do a Roth conversion this year for maybe ten or twenty or thirty or forty thousand dollars, because this year it sounds like your dad died six months ago, so he died in 2021. She's going to file taxes this year, married filing joint, but next year she'll file as a single. 
So she has between now and December 31st to figure out whether a Roth conversion might make sense for her in the lower tax bracket that she finds herself in this year. So that's an area where you'd really want to get some good advice, hopefully from a fiduciary. But check that one out too, as you've got, what is this? This is early October. So you've got a couple of months to get these types of things figured out. And they're super important. So I'm glad you asked the question now. Hopefully this has been helpful. If we can help you in any way, then give us a call and we'd be happy to do that for you. Again, that number to call if you have any questions for David Dickens, whatever situation you're going through as you prepare for retirement and your financial future, feel free to reach out and see if David and the team can help you out. 913-317-1414 is the number to call. That's 913-317-1414. And online at CoverYourAssetsKC.com. And we'll put contact info in the description of today's show so it's easy for you to locate there. Thank you for the questions, everybody. And David, thank you for answering them and giving us some good guidance and advice on the show today. And we'll have another podcast on tap next week. Yep, I will look forward to that. Thanks, Walter. Thanks a lot. That's David Dickens. I'm Walter Storholt. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next time on Cover Your Assets, KC. Investment advisory services offered through Brookstone Capital Management, LLC, BCM, a registered investment advisor. BCM and KC Financial Advisors are independent of each other. For full disclosures, please visit our website at www.coveryourassetskc.com.